Hi, this is Dr. Gary Siskin, and this is the third of a five-part lecture series on the uterine fibroid embolization procedure. Today, we're going to be focusing on the recovery after the procedure. Most patients going through the UFE procedure look at their experience in two parts, the procedure and the recovery. And it's the recovery period which is usually the more difficult of the two. So we know that people who have a solid organ or tumor embolized often experience a post-embolization syndrome that includes pain, nausea and vomiting, fever, fatigue, and generalized malaise. And greater than 90% of patients undergoing UFE experience this type of post-embolization syndrome. Pain is usually the dominant symptom that they experience. And even though the pain is characterized and tolerated differently by each patient, most have pain in one form or another. And the other symptoms that they experience do include the nausea and vomiting, fever, and malaise. When UFE is performed, it leads to both ischemia and inflammation. UFE leads to fibroid ischemia and infarction, in addition to transient myometrial and endometrial ischemia, which is thought to be the primary source of the pain. Tissue ischemia leads to anaerobic metabolism and a buildup of lactic acid and adenosine, which reduces the tissue pH and causes pain. A significant inflammatory component is present as well. It tends to follow ischemia, but is likely also related to the particles used for embolization. This is manifested by an increased white blood cell count within 24 hours of the procedure. The pain after UFE follows a consistent pattern, although there is individual variability. Generally, the first day is difficult for most patients. There's increasing pain over the first two hours, which then plateaus for several hours, and this may or may not be associated with nausea. Hypertension can also be seen in many patients. The pain then rapidly decreases to a much lower level and is usually well tolerated by the next morning. Over the next few days, the pain gradually improves. Most patients don't experience significant nausea during this time, although fatigue is common. This likely corresponds to the complete re reperfusion of the myometrium, which occurs within two to three days in most cases. And most people feel that the worst is behind them by day five. The best approach you can have to addressing the symptoms associated with post-embolization syndrome is to actually have an approach. It's the responsibility of any interventional radiologist performing this procedure to have a post-procedure regimen designed to keep patients comfortable as they recover from fibroid embolization. There continues to be a strong focus on identifying different strategies which can be used to reduce the pain associated with this procedure. And there are medical approaches, neurological approaches, and technical approaches to UFE pain management. In terms of medical approaches, here's what we know. We know we can offer medications to address the pain associated with fibroid embolization. And medications can be directed against pain receptors in the brain and against the inflammatory reaction associated with UFE. Given the concerns surrounding the use of pain medication or aggressive pain medication, it's probably better to target the inflammatory reaction considering the potential side effects and consequences of pain medication use. So when we focus on anti-inflammatory approaches, it is known that IV acetaminophen may have a role. It was shown that less rescue PCA hydromorphone and less medication for nausea was administered when IV Tylenol was used during the recovery period of UFE. Dexamethasone may also have a role. It may offer more than NSAID since it affects the vascular and cellular phase of inflammation. NSAIDs only affect the vascular phase of inflammation. Kim studied this by randomly assigning patients receiving standard medications to either receive or not receive dexamethasone prior to UFE. What they found was that dexamethasone inhibited the elevation of CRP, IL-6, and cortisol during the first 24 hours after UFE, and pain scores were lower in the dexamethasone group. In terms of neurologic approaches, it may be possible to interrupt the transmission of pain from the uterus to the CNS in order to improve patient comfort. 
the afferent pain fibers coming from the uterus return to the central nervous system along sympathetic pathways. They're part of the uterovaginal plexus, which joins with other nerves to form the inferior hypogastric plexus, which is located on each side of the rectum and at the base of the bladder. These nerve plexuses eventually form the right and left hypogastric nerves, which join together to form the superior hypogastric plexus. This is in the retroperitoneum, just ventral to the bifurcation of the abdominal aorta. It is possible to block the transmission in this nerve by using a regional nerve block, and this has been used extensively to control chronic pelvic pain associated with endometriosis and pelvic cancer. From a technical perspective, we can do this under fluoroscopic guidance during the UFB procedure. We use an anterior approach with the goal of targeting the superior hypogastric nerve plexus where it ascends in the prespinal space at L4-S1 before crossing the level of the aortic bifurcation. So with the angiographic catheter in place, and this is in place to help identify the position of the aortic bifurcation, a 22 gauge chiba needle is advanced to the anterior border of the vertebral column just inferior to the bifurcation. We can then inject contrast through the needle to confirm an intravascular tip position, and then 20 cc's of bupivacaine can then be injected. And this is one of my favorite published diagrams by Brooke Spencer showing, showing this. And you can also see some fluoroscopic images just localizing the um, point of access into the superior hypogastric nerve plexus just below the aortic bifurcation. This was first studied back in 2004. 139 patients underwent a superior hypogastric nerve block during fibroid embolization. All of these patients were discharged the day of the procedure with a 5% readmission rate, and there were low medication requirements. And these authors concluded that a superior hypogastric nerve block enhances pain control and allows UFE to be performed as an outpatient procedure. More recently, Yoon published their experience in 2018. This was a prospective trial with 44 patients randomized to either receive a superior hypogastric nerve block or to not receive one. They then assessed pain scores and medication requirements. In this study, 20 ml of 0.5% ropivacaine was used for the nerve block because it has a long acting effect and it's active for approximately eight hours. In addition, it's associated with low levels of cardiotoxicity. And they showed that the nerve block improved post-procedure pain. There were lower pain scores immediately after embolization. There were lower post-procedure narcotic doses and there were lower requirements for anti-emetic medication. Now getting back to anatomy for a second, as you follow the fibers, the fibers of the hypogastric nerve upwards, they typically enter the spinal canal at T10 to T12. So some have theorized that a thoracic epidural can work to control pain after fibroid embolization. It was shown that epidural analgesia provides superior pain control to PCA intravenous medication six and 24 hours after fibroid embolization, but this is associated with a higher cost and a higher risk of complications. A retrospective study was then done evaluating consecutive patients undergoing either an epidural or a superior hypogastric nerve block. They pointed out that the nerve block took an average of four and a half minutes to perform, and they also used ropivacaine as the medication for the nerve block. And what they showed was that the opiate medication requirements in the superior hypogastric nerve block group was much lower than the epidural group. And they also showed that the group receiving a nerve block did not require any opiates for a mean greater than 4.5 hours. The next question is whether or not there are technical modifications that can be made in order to reduce the amount of post-procedural pain experienced by patients without compromising outcomes. Some have wondered whether or not the choice of embolic agent matters. A study was done looking at non-spherical PVA versus embospheres, and they showed no difference in pain control after fibroid embolization. When a study was done evaluating gel foam versus embosphere, it was found that the amount of immediate post-procedure pain may be less with gel foam alone, 
but that couldn't be demonstrated objectively using morphine as a measure of pain. Katsumori studied 101 consecutive patients, with one group receiving gel foam to near stasis and the second group receiving embosphere with a limited endpoint. The visual analog scores and pain medication doses were both significantly lower in the embosphere group, and this finding was attributed to the less aggressive embolization endpoint. What about the way we inject that embolic agent? It was shown in 2015 that an intermittent super low pressure injection where the embolic agent is just barely pushed out of the catheter and a progressively decreased dose of embolic is administered with each injection is associated with decreased pain. Of course, it makes sense that this was also associated with increased procedure time compared to standard technique. In recent years, many people have been discussing the use of intraarterial lidocaine as a way to manage or control pain after UFE. This was actually tried from the very beginning of the UFE experience. Scott Goodwin tried administering 100 milligrams of lidocaine in each uterine artery prior to embolization based on Ravina's initial report that patients experienced severe pelvic pain with UFE. Unfortunately, these patients had very intense pain, so this was discontinued. In 2001, a study evaluated 18 patients receiving either lidocaine or placebo prior to embolization. Moderate to severe vasospasm was noted in patients after lidocaine injection, and no spasm at all was seen in the placebo patients. The patients receiving lidocaine had less subjective pain, but there was no difference in medication requirements. And these authors suggested that intraarterial lidocaine should not be used due to the possible effects of vasospasm on outcomes. More recent discussions about the use of intraarterial lidocaine surrounded this study that was published in 2017. 60 patients were randomized to receive either 100 milligrams of lidocaine mixed with the first vial of PVA, 100 milligrams of lidocaine after the embolization endpoint was reached, or no lidocaine at all. And the data collected included visual analog pain scores at 4, 7, and 24 hours after UFE, as well as the dose of narcotic agents used. Both groups that received lidocaine had significantly less pain at 4 hours and required less medication than the control group. However, the group receiving lidocaine during embolization had worse outcomes than the other two groups in terms of fibroid infarction rates, and this speaks to vasospasm being an issue with an early injection of lidocaine. The group concluded that lidocaine administered after injection or after embolization can help control the pain experienced after UFE. Three years later, Katsumori studied 100 patients undergoing UFE with embosphere microspheres using a pruned tree endpoint. The first 50 patients received no lidocaine, and the second group received lidocaine in each uterine artery immediately after embolization. And this group found no significant differences in pain scores. So intraarterial lidocaine administered immediately after UFE does not result in significant pain reductions. So in my opinion, the most recent study and several other studies have questioned the effectiveness of intraarterial lidocaine administered after embolization. I've questioned it myself because I don't understand why this would work after the vessel has already been embolized, and I'm concerned that doing it this way increases the risk of reflux and compromise to surrounding organs. So this has made it difficult for me to justify the use of this technique. So we know that pain is an expected part of the post-embolization syndrome experienced by most patients after UFE, and in my opinion, the most important approach to managing UFE pain is to actually have an approach. So in terms of when the patients can be discharged, it was reported early that outpatient UFE is safe and effective, assuming there's defined telephone follow-up, staff availability, and a protocol designed to alleviate post-procedure constitutional symptoms. And this has become common at many hospitals and outpatient offices. It's still probably more common for patients to spend a night in the hospital on IV pain medication as they recover from the procedure. It is very rare for patients to spend more than one night in the hospital, which corresponds to the expected time course for pain that most patients experience. 
Office-based follow-up is a key component of the care offered to patients after they undergo this procedure. Our routine is to have patients come in for two office visits, but the timing is somewhat arbitrary. The first visit's done at three to four weeks after the procedure. This is arranged to make sure that the patient has appropriately recovered from the procedure and has returned to normal activity. We also see them usually around six months, but anywhere from three to six months. This is arranged to make sure the presenting symptoms have been addressed and that the fibroids have been successfully treated. The most important part of the recovery is that patients need to have a way of reaching the IR team if they have any questions or concerns as they recover from the procedure. Interventional radiologists know more about this procedure than any other physician, so forcing a patient to call their gynecologist or go to the ED to have concerns addressed is likely going to make things much more difficult for them. Once they get past that initial recovery period, most people can return to normal activity within five to 10 days. It's certainly variable based on an individual patient's tolerance for the symptoms they're experiencing. And in general, patients can resume normal activities, including going back to work, exercise, sex, or anything else considered normal when they feel up to it. So in conclusion, the recovery is most often the difficult part of the experience for most patients. Understanding what patients should expect, having a treatment plan in place, and making sure that patients are appropriately educated are important responsibilities of all interventionalists performing this procedure.